Ruth chapter number 3, and I want us to look again, if we could, and look at verse number 7, Ruth chapter 3, verse number 7, in God's Word. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Now, we talked about last week what the meaning was behind what Ruth was doing. It was not immoral. It was totally in line with um, what the law said and what she believed and what Naomi believed that God had uh, put on her heart to do. And uh, so this is not, this is not an immoral scene. And usually the people who come up with those things are uh, biblical criticists. I mean, they, they, they criticize every uh, part of the Bible they can, and they're looking for things, and this is far from an immoral uh, setting. So don't let anybody tell you that. And so we see her uh, coming in, and uh, Boaz there uh, in the threshing floor. We talked about that last week, and what we said last week was that you, you don't want to get blessings from God and miss the blesser. And you don't want to receive of the Lord and thank you, thank you, thank you and and forget who it is is giving, gave you. And, uh, you know, it's so easy to do. And you remember this and when somebody uh, gives you something and the more they give you, the less you appreciate it usually. Now, we know, don't, don't look, is that true? That's true. And the more, at least, you may not say you appreciate it less, but you come to expect it. And so it's not a shock that somebody uh, just did something nice for you or kind for you. May God cultivate in all of us a spirit of gratitude that if the smallest act of kindness is shown to us, that we respond with gratitude. And uh, so uh, here we see that she is, is coming um, to the threshing floor. Boaz is there asleep. He's guarding uh, the corn and guarding the barley, rather, and uh, guarding the product from the field. And so here she comes, and she comes in. She comes in quietly and basically letting, letting God do his work here. And uh, in verse number 8, it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. So here she is laying at his feet, and he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Uh, Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. At this point, we can hear wedding bells. There's wedding music playing here. I mean, this, this is it. I mean, because the, the spreading was a sign, and we'll talk about this phrase in just a moment, but it was, it was a marital sign of, of protection uh, from a husband to a wife. And so here we see wedding music is in the air. And uh, I know we joke about, you know, I just, uh, I've heard preachers say before jokingly, I guess jokingly, they'd rather do a funeral than a wedding. Uh, But uh, not me. Not me because it's a joyous occasion. It's a joyous occasion. And and for so many, boy, they walk in and think that's, you know, I... I gave up all my rights when I got married. Man, I got the best thing outside of Jesus Christ that ever happened to me when I got married. I feel sorry for y'all because, I, I mean, it was good. Amen. I mean, I didn't even want to stop when we was walking down the aisle. We was sitting there talking to each other about just keep walking. Like, don't even stop. Don't go to the reception. Don't go past, you know, go past, go, receive your 200 and hit the door. Go. I mean, we just wanted to get out of there, you know. We were married in love. And guess what? We're still in love. Because it's not based on a feeling. It's based on a commitment. Amen. And uh, I hope she still loves me. I love her. (laughs) Amen. If I keep talking about her, she's not going to love me as much. (laughs) But, you know, it it is a sign here that, that business is picking up. And so Boaz is thinking the whole time. He's a gentleman. He's thinking, you know what? 
She's got other options besides me. But in God's infinite wisdom and plan, God knew who he was putting together for what purpose at what time. He had every detail orchestrated, again reminding us that your life is not a bunch of unconnected, disconnected uh, blob. And you just end up there by chance. Oh, we ended up here by chance. No, no, no. No such thing as accidents in God's economy. No such thing as chance and uh, fate. Fate, my hind leg. There's no fate. <laughs> We're not in the hands of, of some demigods. We're in the hands of an almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing God who orchestrates the events of our life. And here, Ruth is a benefactor of God orchestrating from the very beginning uh, her life. So wedding music is play. I mean, I can, I can, excitement is in the air now because uh, this is about to happen. And so she said, she initiated, as I, I said last week, this was not a forward request, but he was waiting as a gentleman thinking, I mean, he was old enough to be her father here. And so he thought, I'm the last one that, uh, that she would want to be the redeemer and that even could be. And, and just so happens in God's plan, he was a kinsman, and uh, he was the nearest one that agreed to, to take her back. And, you know, the big deal about being the, the kinsman was the land issue. Land was a precious commodity in this day and time. And so when you had somebody, your husband died, if there was no near kinsman, then you basically lost uh, that land and you lost the ability to care for yourself. And so uh, the law initiated this process so that she would not have to uh, go to the streets, if you will, and uh, just just beg. She was able to find a near kinsman to redeem her. And that that's exactly what God had orchestrated and planned. Now look again in verse number 9. He said, Who art thou? And she answered, I'm Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore... Thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. He wasn't the only one, but he was a near kinsman. And so she says here, spread thy skirt. In other words, indicate, signify by covering me that you accept me. And I'm glad that, that he, he did. Verse 10, and he said, Blessed be thou, the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. In other words, you had a chance to get anybody you wanted here, basically. But you chose me. And he said, I'm, I'm thankful. I want us to see this morning some elements of this, elements of Ruth's blessing, but also just what happened when, when this wedding music started. You know, what, is, what happens? Well, first of all, I want us to see his proposition and her covering. His proposition and her covering. And uh, he, he answered there in verse 9, Spread therefore, she said, thy skirt. And uh, then verse 12, The Lord recompense thy work, and her full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's Ruth 2.12. Turn back and look at that verse. I want you to see it. Here's the phrase again, And the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now there's significance about this phrase uh, spread therefore thy skirt, or basically thy, the wings of thy garment, thy wings indicating uh, wings uh, over me. In Ruth 12, the same phrase. It's not an accident that those two phrases are very similar uh, in this book. And this spread thy skirt phrase vividly pictures provision, protection, and partnership in the context, a beautiful example of marriage and what marriage should be. It should be protection. It should be provision. It should be a partnership. Uh, it shouldn't be some solo event. Amen. A lot of marriages, people uh, cohabit. They coexist. They're not partners in life. They just tolerate each other. I feel sorry for you if all you have in a marriage is one another to tolerate. You just tolerate each other. You know, there's a lot of people I tolerate and you tolerate. How many of them tolerate somebody? Hopefully not in this room. Amen. We 
don't tolerate. But man, to be married to the person that you just had to tolerate, what misery. What a horrible event to, to know that you're married to somebody that you feel like you, you have to tolerate. Marriage should be protection, provision, one looking out for another. And, uh, and guys, when the Bible speaks of the wife being the wicker vessel, that's not uh, in value. That's in how we should treat them. That's fine china. You don't run through the house with fine china playing football. Man, you, you, you wrap that stuff up and you, you walk very soldier-like and gingerly when you're carrying china. And so it is with our spouses, husbands, treat your wives and love them as Christ loved the church. And he's not, uh, he's not careless with his church. Neither should you be with your spouse. But this spread thy skirt was a beautiful picture of protection, of provision of the Lord um, here in this, in this phrase. I want you to remember, I, I remember, and as we think about her covering, I'm glad for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That spread thy skirt not only meant that, hey, I'm providing for you, I'm protecting you, we're partners together. But it, and, and by the way, I remind you, to those who are born again, we are called the bride of Christ. We've been pursued and we've been bought with a price and that price was the precious blood of Jesus Christ and I'm thankful for the day that Jesus covered my sins, washed them away, blotted them out as far as the east is from the west, threw them in the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Thank God for the covering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this culture, this, this wicked culture, this wild culture that we live in and uh, where accusations, we live in a, in a mob mentality, in a mob culture. You're, you have a right to your opinion, but you don't have a right to give your opinion if that means that you are infringing on mine by communicating threats. You know where I'm going with that. Hopefully you get, you get the hint. If you didn't, ask your wife. She got it. Psalm 32, 1. Also, this verse is repeated in Romans. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You know, there's nothing like knowing that your sin's forgiven. Like, there's nothing like knowing the, because, you know, sin creates guilt and fear. I mean, you're always looking over your shoulder. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. I remember before I got saved, it was one small step after another of fear looking over my shoulder, wondering when the time would come that I would die. When would one of those nightmares become a reality for me? When would I stand before God in judgment? I mean, man, it's just a life full of, of footsteps of fear and guilt and shame. All oh, the glad days of a 14-year-old boy when I bowed my head and heart in humble submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted his payment for my sin. What a glad day when his blood covered my sin. And uh, thank God for the day. And if you're here and you've never been covered, oh, there's nothing like it. Please forgive this. Forgive this right here. Please show this to Brother Fredericks, okay? Please show him. Isaac, could you stand up? Because I know you love this, so stand up. Yeah, gladly he'll stand up, yeah. Hey, there's nothing like when the devil comes pointing and saying, hey, remember this, remember that. Remember when you did that? Remember when you did that? Yeah, I remember. Remember when you said that? Yeah, I remember. Remember when you went there? Yeah, I remember. Remember when all that happened? Yeah, I remember. And God says, hold on a minute. <laughs> it's covered. It's covered. Thank God for his covering and the forgiveness that he offers through Jesus Christ. There is no program that does that. There is no midnight drink that does that. There's no Thai tea that's going to uh, give you the feeling that God gives you when you know beyond a doubt that your sins are gone. They're covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we live in a culture that's carrying around the reason they look so mean and mad and hateful because they're carrying 
carrying a sackload of sin on their shoulders and they're beaten down and bent down by it because they've not yet received the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. I'm glad she was covered. He said, oh, yes. And I'm glad God, when looking down on a culture and a sea of humanity that was covered in sin, I'm glad that Jesus, to the bidding of God the Father, said, yes, Father, I'll go. Yes, Father, I'll die and I'll bleed so that those sins can be covered. Blessed is he whose transgressions are covered. And the writer in Romans thought it was so good that he repeated it. Boy, it is a good verse. Blessed. Then in Psalm 85, too, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. I like this verse, Isaiah 61, 10. If you don't mind, turn there. I want you to mark this in your Bibles if you get a chance. And I appreciate the verses on the screen but uh, I, sometimes that keeps us from turning now. I really appreciate him because I don't have to use my glasses when I look up there. So I do appreciate him. But uh, I want you to turn to this one if you can. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice... In the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Covered. Forgiven. And I understand this is in reference to a nation and God restoring and God recovering a nation and God being the, the bride uh, or the groom, rather, of, of a nation. I, I get all that, but I'm glad through salvation we are covered in the garments of salvation. We are covered in his precious blood. Our sins are gone. And uh, quit, quit floundering around. Quit flailing every time Satan comes and sticks his ugly head at you and reminds you of you, your past. Remind him of his future and remind him of what happened at Calvary when he bled and died not for the sins of a one-time event but, the, but all the sins of humanity. He died for all of them. If he didn't die for all of them, he didn't die for any of them. If he didn't die to forgive you of all of them, he didn't die to forgive you of any of them. He died to forgive you of all of them. Now again, I repeat in Romans 6, do we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We don't do that. But oh, hallelujah, we don't sit and sour in pity and uh, in regret and in fear and in guilt when Satan comes and says, oh, hey, you remember that? Oh, yes, I remember it well. But also remember that May the 4th, 1986, Sunday morning about 12.15, on the piano side, fourth row back, I bowed my head and asked Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sin. And based upon his word, he did it. He did it. My sins are covered. If you're saved, they're covered. If you're not, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and uh, in preaching two funerals yesterday, and you know, there's a lot of people who think they're, they're good, and a lot of churches don't preach uh, about, you know, having to get, even get saved. And there's a guy sitting beside Brother Fredericks yesterday. Where do you go? He says, I go where he goes. <laughs> That's my church. And uh, this is a dear, a dear friend of another denomination who... I mean, all it was was a salvation message, but boy, people, people don't hear it much, and uh, they, they don't hear it. They, they think if they're good enough, they think if they come to church and do good deeds and be good to their neighbor and all of that, they're going to get to heaven. I want to say to you, it's good to do good deeds. It's good to be a good neighbor, uh, but those things will not get you to heaven unless you've had a, a head-on collision with your sin and the grace of Christ. You will not get to heaven unless you've been convicted and converted. You will not get to heaven. There is no conversion until yet first there is conviction. That's why it's good to ask people if they say, yeah, I'm saved. Well, tell me about when you got under conviction. Huh? What's that? Unless the Spirit of God draws a man 
Bible says he, he's not of his. He can't be saved unless the Spirit of God draws him. That's called conviction. It's not just, oh, yeah, I believe all that. Yeah, I believe what you believe, Pastor. No, no, no. It's more than mental assent to a body of facts. It's being converted. It's being born again. When you're born again, birth, it doesn't just happen by, oh, yeah, that's good. I'll take some fries with that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that easy. It's not ordering, ordering a happy meal at McDonald's. Births are hard. <laughs> They're labor. They're big events. And by the way, when they happen, you know they happen. Ladies, can I get amen? When births happen, you know they're happening. Daddies, when they, when they happen, you know they happen. I promise you, if you're anywhere on the planet, you did. And if you're not close, you, you're still paying for that one today. Right? Because it's a big deal. So when we get saved, it's a big deal. I mean, it's not just some. oh, yeah, I believe Jesus died for me. Wonderful. The devils do also. I believe that Jesus rose again. Hey, the devils do also. And you know what they do when they believe it? They tremble. They tremble because they, they believe because it's a fact. Jesus died. He did die. He didn't just fall off to sleep. He died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again. It's a fact, and they believe it. They don't dispute the facts. But it's more than just saying all that. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe that ever since I was a child. Wonderful. When is the first time then that you've seen it was your sins that put him on the cross? It was your sins and my sins that put him in the tomb. It was your sins and my sins when they, when they put the crown of thorns upon his head and spit on his brow. It was your sins and my sins that did all that to him. When is the last time you saw that and saw your sin as ugly before an almighty holy God? And unless you get forgiveness, you will not enter into heaven. If there was another entrance, then Jesus died in vain. She was covered. And then verse 10, he says, and he said, Blessed be thou, of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And you know, what was, what was Ruth's latter kindness? What was that? What was he referring to when he says, the kindness now is greater than the kindness before. What is he uh, referring to? You know, Ruth's former act of devotion was the initial act when she said, I'm not going back to Moab. Hey, I'm going with you, Naomi. That was her first act of devotion. Boaz says, hey, I want to know that. I want you to know, Ruth, that was a good, that was a good thing. God bless you for doing right, Ruth. And by the way, we ought, to take, we ought to tell people, commend people when they do right. Because we sure fuss when they do wrong. Amen. So we ought to commend them when they do right. And, you know, well, to build pride. Will you let God take care of that? He has a knack for taking care of pride. Amen. Let God deal with the pride. You just do right by commending people for doing right. And he said, I want, I want to say what you did in going with uh, Naomi here to Bethlehem was a noble deed. But this, this latter act, when he says here, when he says in verse 10, For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter than at the beginning. The first act, the beginning act, was going with Naomi. The second part is when, he said, when she said she wanted Boaz. He said, I want you to know this is the best of the two. <laughs> he said, I appreciate you wanting to carry on your deceased husband's name and bear children and I appreciate you choosing me when you could have chosen somebody else and boy I tell you we ought to be thankful and say God I appreciate you choosing us when you didn't have to he didn't have to I mean I can see Boaz thinking you know you had every choice in the world here but you chose me and he says Ruth I just want you to know I appreciate your choices and I appreciate God. Of all the things, I mean, he has already destroyed one earth because of sin. The flood, remember? Let's not forget. So why did he not do it to us? Only the pure mercy of God. So we need to say, hey, thank you, Lord, for choosing. 
to redeem, to cover us. What a blessing. Not only her covering. Number two, I want you to see her character. We see his proposition. We see her position. As I mentioned, in, this, in the midst of a society that appears to enjoy wallowing in the pigsty of immorality. And we've seen this in this, in this latest Supreme Court nomination. They think not twice to destroy whoever, whenever. We live in a, in a society of, of immorality. It's everywhere. It's a pigsty. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's imperative that in this swamp of immorality, it's imperative that you and I live a life of virtue. So she goes here and she, she does right. He spreads the skirt and says, basically, I, I accept. This is good. Then verse 11, look at it. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. He says, I'll take care of you. And I'm glad God does that to us. Amen. For all the city. Now, here's what I want you to notice. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. I've read through Ruth. I don't know how many times, but I just never have caught that. But he says, I, I want you to be aware, all this city knows you're a virtuous woman. I wonder today, this is not necessarily directed at ladies today, the whole message, but I wonder, ladies, would this be said of you? Does all this community know that you're a virtuous woman? Does the fellows down at your job know you're a virtuous woman? What's your reputation? Does your daily conduct reflect your faith and virtue? Does the daily events of your life characterize a person of faith and a person of virtue? It did for Ruth. And if anybody had any reason to do whatever it took to be taken care of, it was Ruth, right? Would you agree? I mean, here she is in a foreign land. I mean, you, you got to look out for yourself, right? She doesn't have a husband, but she did it right. She lived by virtue, and no matter what's going on, I don't care who does what. Boy, in this day, well, so and so, well, everybody has one, well, everybody's doing that, well, everybody, no, 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 no. Don't, don't fall for that. Parents and mamas, don't say that. Daddies, I don't care who down the job is doing it, everybody's not doing it. People of virtue are not doing it. I promise you. So all this stuff, everybody, this is just the culture. You're 46 years old, living in the 50s, and you're out of time, out of step with humanity and the culture, Pastor. Things have changed. Let me tell you, virtue never changes. It's transcendent to cultures, as is the Word of God. And I want to say to you, it's time for us. And in the day when it's so dark and so vile and so filthy, virtue ought to stand out. It should shine as a ferment. I mean, it ought to be bright when you stand and do right. And we ought to have, where is virtue going to come from, by the way? It's not going to come from the Moose Lodge. It's not going to come from the PTA. It's not going to come from our society or our culture. Where in the world is virtue going to come from? Hey, who's the one that's going to tell them down at the job to quit skimming off the top? It's going to be right here. Who's going to tell them that it's wrong if you work eight hours to put on your time sheet that you work nine and a half? It's right here. Who's going to tell them down at the job that you don't keep some uh, you don't keep a little extra for yourself because, after all, you put a lot into this company. Oh, no. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell those men down there that's flirting with every woman in the factory that uh, it's wicked and vile to do that and it's immoral and he ought not do it? Who's going to do it? If we are not people of virtue, who's going to be? If you're saved, God's called you to a person of virtue. If you live your life with no virtue, your life will be of no value. None. We see the similarities of Ruth in the Proverbs 31 woman. I'd love for you to do a study on it sometime. And, but I want to give you just, just several things here about her character. 
according to Ruth chapter 1. Turn back to Ruth 1. We'll stay in the book of Ruth and you can look in Proverbs later at another time. But Ruth chapter 1 verse 15 here through 18. You remember these verses. Ruth said, I'm going with you, Naomi. She was devoted the same way with the Proverbs 31 woman. She was devoted to her family. She was devoted to her family. I've never seen the beat in my life today. And uh, listen, there's nothing, you know, I, if, you, if your husband wants you to work outside the home, you work outside the home, that's between you and him. That's right. It's between you and him. But I, 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 listen, God never called you to be more devoted to your job than your family. Amen. God never called you to do that. He gave you a husband before he gave you kids. He gave you kids before he gave you a job in that sense. And if the family's suffering, be careful how, many, how much time we're spending away from the home. She was devoted to her family. She said, I'm going where you go. I'm with you, Naomi. And look at chapter 2, verse 2. She delighted in her work. She delighted in her work. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn. After him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. She got to work. Proverbs 31 woman was a woman who delighted in her work. She wasn't afraid to work. And I've said it two Sundays in a row, so I'm not going to say anything else about work, okay? You know how I feel about it. Number three, she delighted in her labor. She delighted in it. She was glad about it. 2-7, Ruth 2-7. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. She didn't stay in the house. She was working. She was getting it done. And she liked it. She was glad about it. And then she was dedicated to godly speech. Look at verse 10 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 10. She was dedicated to godly speech. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? She spoke like a, like a queen, like a lady. Well, there's nothing worse in this world than hearing a woman talk foul. And by the way, gentlemen, there's nothing worse than hearing you say it either. It's good for the goose. It's good for the gander. It's no better just because you're a man. Amen. You don't get no pass on foul talk. But boy, there's nothing so just, just, it's like, I mean, you may as well take your fingernails, lady, and get on that blackboard and go across them with all five and burn my ears up with that screeching sound as to say something off color. She was dedicated to godly speech. A woman of virtue is. And that means, that means criticizing, backbiting, and all that tail bearing and Sowing discord, that's in Proverbs 2. Amen. One thing God hates. Amen. I, listen, don't, don't, be, don't be, have a godly speech, ladies and gentlemen. That means not talking about everybody. Listen, if all you had to talk about at a dinner table is somebody else, change subjects. Change subjects. And some of you ought to be virtuous enough if it's happening at a large table to change the course of the conversation. Amen. I'll throw water on it in a heartbeat. Amen. Somebody starts talking about somebody, I'll make that steak taste so bad you won't ever want to go with me again. Amen. And that's, we need that. What is that called? People of virtue. Well, I just didn't want to say nothing. Why not? So you wanted somebody else's character to be slandered like Kavanaugh without, without any proof and you just sitting here taking it. No. Amen. Now I'm not getting sides on Kavanaugh. Don't buck on that. Whew. But I am saying, listen, you shouldn't. People ought not be able to attack somebody's character. God's people ought not be able to do it. Any, don't even do it. I don't care if you've got a book full of proof. It's probably not good for discussion. Amen. She was dedicated to godly speech. There's things more to talk about. Man, there's good things to talk about. We had three people baptized last Sunday night. Two people joined the church. That's good stuff to talk about. I mean, we had, a, we had staff that worked their heads off this week to take care of grieving families. There's good stuff to talk about. 
A lot of a lot of good stuff. You talk about the weather. I'd rather you talk about the weather than somebody. Talk about the Braves or something, but leave leave church people out of it. Amen. <laughs> Don't talk about the Braves either. She was dedicated to godly speech. She was dependent on the Lord. Look at verse 12, chapter 2. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. She was dependent on the Lord. You know what it says when people talk about other people? It says they don't trust God enough to get their value, so they got to run somebody else down or talk about the latest juicy gossip because they don't feel confident enough in who God made them and their relationship to the Lord, so they got to go talk about everybody. You, you find that. You'll find that true. They don't, they don't value themselves enough inside of God. So they, they've got to get one up on it. They've got to find the juiciest, latest, fresh off the rumor mill so that they look like they're in. No matter if it's true or not, no matter who it hurts or not. Well, that ought not be God's people. We ought to be dependent on the Lord. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. We talked about this last week. Not only was she dedicated to godly speech, dependent on God, she dressed with care. She dressed with care. She understood she was a daughter of God. I mean, she was getting ready to marry Boaz. She took care of things. She was going to go meet him. And, you know, it it ought to, we we ought to care about what God thinks about the way we dress. I know God looks on the heart. I get it. But man sees the outside before he ever sees the inside. So we ought to take, we ought to take care in presenting ourselves. If we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, we ought to take time to present ourselves before the Lord as some way that would be honorable unto Him. Amen. And it's not about, well, you know, people ought not think bad. It's about what does the Lord think? It's presenting ourselves in a way. And she cared about it. She just didn't, you know, and uh, she just didn't jump out in front of Boaz. She took time to get ready and to think about the way she looked. And, you know, all of us ought to take, take pride in the fact that we're saved. If you can't witness to somebody the way you're looking during the week, you probably ought to change. Well, I, I work in a place where I get oil on my shirt. That's okay. Oil never, it's okay. But you know, we ought to present ourselves in a way that's pleasing to God. And all this talk about the way you come to church, and I'm getting done. The way you come to church. We, we don't have a dress code here in the sense that you've got to look this way before you come into church. Well, our doors are open to everybody. Amen. These doors are open to everybody. No matter how they come in. But if you're a member here and you're saved, y'all want to come with your best. Amen. Amen. Y'all want to come with your best. And I appreciate the way our church does and the way uh, you you look and dress with care. And then look at verse 6. She was discreet. Verse 6 of chapter 3. And she went down to the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. She was discreet with men. She was careful to do it the right way, the way mama said, the way mother-in-law said it. She, she carried herself around men uh, the way. And you know, men ought to carry themselves like gentlemen too. Amen. And you ought, you ought to treat ladies with respect. They're not second-class citizens and they're not just, you know, uh, to be ignored. You ought to treat them like ladies. And ladies, you ought, to be, you ought to not be forward with men unless it's your husband. I can't hear good. Let me make sure. (laughs) You ought to be discreet. Now, you and your husband, you're married. You ought to initiate holding his hand every now and then. It won't hurt nothing. You can kiss him first. It'd be okay. I still can't hear good. All right. (laughs) Listen for my wife, right? And... uh, with other men, be discreet. You know, over the years, I've, I've, I've noticed women of virtue, they do that. And we have a lot of them in this church. I mean, to carry yourself appropriately, discreetly with men. And you know what? I appreciate that. As pastor, I, I want to finish my race. I want to finish. I want to finish with one woman. And I appreciate 
you carrying yourself appropriately around around the church. I appreciate that. It helps me, and I ain't got to have, uh, I do have a bodyguard with me all, all, all the time, but it ain't because of that. I, I appreciate the way you carry yourself and appropriateness. You know, God's people ought to be appropriate people. Amen. Ought to be appropriate people. And then she delivered blessings. When she went back in chapter 4, and even after this, he said, take your veil off. And, and uh, I want you, he, he told her to leave at night so nobody would see her. He didn't want, he didn't want no, no rumors started. And he told her to get the veil out. And, he, and the Bible says he laid it on her. He loaded her down with corn on that veil. And she went back and delivered the blessings. You know what God will do when you honor him? He'll bless your life. He'll bless your life. She was covered and she had character. She had character. I'm glad we've been covered. How about you? I'm glad we've been forgiven. And, and because of that, we ought to have character. We ought to, we ought to have character. May God help us. If you're here today and you're not covered, you can be. You can be. If there's some things in your life we need to work on, let's work on them today.